All right, so we should be recording, and uh, thanks to everybody that joined us today. Uh, for those that don't know me, I'm Wes Barefoot, Director of Franchise Development with Shelf Genie. Um, this is our weekly Franchise Partner Spotlight webinar. So uh, this is something we started several weeks ago and have gotten really good feedback on, but each week we're inviting a different Shelf Genie franchise owner to join us where we can just uh, kind of pick their brain a little bit, and then we'll open it up to Q&A uh, for the folks that have called in live. So a uh, really good opportunity for you to ask any questions that you may have um, on any of these calls. Um, this week we have Michael Saunders joining us. Mike, thanks again for taking some time to do this. Um, you can thank P uh, Keisha for that picture. I don't know where she got it, but uh, that's the one that she chose. So I sent um, it because the one she had was about 10 years old, I think. <laughs> All right, fair enough. Um, so yeah, just a little bit of background on Michael. I, I, I won't uh, steal too much of his thunder. I'll kick it over to him here in just a minute. But uh, Michael's been a franchise partner with Shelf Genie since December 2011. Uh, he's based in the Columbus, Ohio area. And then since joining, he has also added the Cincinnati and Dayton, Ohio markets as well. Um, and I'll let him talk a little bit more about his territories once we get into it. Um, Michael's been very involved in, in the Shelf Genie organization since joining. Uh, you can see he's been the uh, president of our Franchise Advisory Council. That's what FAC stands for, uh, for 2017 and 18. Uh, still on the, the FAC now. Uh, he's also involved in some other committees that we have a, a combination of folks from the home office as well as franchise owners on. Uh, committees revolving around manufacturing, our five-star program, and Wishmaker, which is our, our sales form, which was a big initiative uh, in 2018 that we rolled out. Um, he's also collected some awards along the way, uh, Rookie of the Year in, in 2013, uh, Rising Star in 2016, and Franchisee of the Year 2017 and 2018. So um, with that, I will turn it over to Michael. And uh, Mike, maybe just start off by uh, sharing a little bit of your background, you know, kind of how you got to, to be involved in Shelf Genie, what you did before uh, joining and, and uh, you know, just a little bit of your story since becoming a Shelf Genie franchise partner. Yeah. So um, prior to doing Shelf Genie, I actually worked for Honda Engineering in Marysville, Ohio. So I was a uh, when I hired in there, I was a CNC machinist. I was a tool and die maker. But over the 23 years that I was there, I'd worked up through lots of different management positions, managing both people and projects. Um, I did pretty much, I think, everything you could possibly do when I was there. Um, in 2011, I lost my job with Honda. And at that point in time, I kind of started reliving my adolescence, started thinking, you know, oh, maybe I could be a fireman or a policeman or something, you know, crazy like that. Or maybe I'll go back to college and, you know, just nothing was clicking for me. Um, for me to stay in the industry I was in, I was going to have to move up to Detroit. I'm a single father. I was divorced at the time. I haven't had a four or five-year-old daughter at that point in time. Did not want to move away from her, obviously. So a friend of a friend actually had bought a franchise. It was a window washing franchise. And the friend told me how the process went about how you get a franchise consultant and you go through that whole process. She talked about how it was free, all that. So I said, why not? Let's give this a shot. Um, so I went through that whole process and she brought three franchises to me. And those three franchises, I basically ruled them all out um, through my due diligence. Just different reasons, you know, one, the territories, the one area, the territories were like an hour and a half away. One, I just really didn't like the concept. Another one um, was a resale in Columbus and the guy ended up deciding not to resell. So all of those kind of fell apart. And then after that, she started talking to me about the medical field and that just really didn't appeal to me. And then at that time, I think it was when was uh, Shelf Genie was really trying to push, you know, starting to sell fran more franchises. And she had just been somewhere where she had heard about Shelf Genie and been shown Shelf Genie. She brought it to me and 
from the first minute she brought Shelf Genie to me, just everything I checked on, everything I did, everything just clicked with me. It's something that resonated with me. I'm a relatively organized guy. Everything's kind of got its spot. It's a product that I always wanted to have in my kitchen. Um, I loved all the processes, the procedures that they had, because that really tied into my Honda background. And talking to the franchisees, they were all really great, willing to help, met the home office, and it just, like I said, it just kept clicking to the point where I said, let's do this. And, you know, nine years later, here I sit. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a story that's, you know, I think <clears throat> fairly common. You know, a lot of people end up exploring franchising as a result of, you know, in, in some way or another coming to a, a crossroads in their life, whether that's a, uh, you know, a, a job was outsourced or, or there was a layoff or, you know, for whatever reason, they just decided it was time to make a change. And, um, you know, for some people, they've always dreamed of business ownership. For others, it's something that they really didn't think about until, uh, you know, deciding to look more closely at, at franchising. So um, what were some of the, the most, I mean, I think you hit on some of this already, but maybe just to clarify, what were some of the most important things to you when you were evaluating some of the different, you know, franchise opportunities that you did look at? Um, you know, some of the ones I looked at, like one was called hoods. You go in and you, you clean the the hoods in restaurants, the vents from ceiling to the roof. Yep. The problem with that one was that my territory would have been in Dayton, Ohio. So it was like an hour and a half for me to just get to the territory. Um, and the biggest thing that I didn't like about it, and this is one of the things I didn't like about a lot of them. It's you got to go cold call these people to try and get business. And that just did not appeal to me at all. You know, being given this book of here's all these people call them. You know, and I got to try and convince these people to work with me. Right. With Shelf Genie, they're calling us asking me to come. Yeah. It's a totally different process. And that, that, I really like that. So let's, let's talk a little bit about that. And then I want to circle back to, to talk about territories um, as well. But uh, maybe share a little bit about what your, your marketing strategy has been and, and also maybe how it's evolved over the nine years uh, since you opened business. But how do you go about generating new clients? Um, I mean, the way you do it at first for a startup versus the way you do it nine years in is slightly different. Yeah. You know, when you're starting, you're trying to brand build. So there are advertising things you should do in magazines and stuff like that that may not produce as many appointments but they build your brand where nine years in, I'm not as much about building my brand as I am generating appointments. So, you know, every, the, the biggest, the biggest appointment generator for any Shell Genie franchisees is home shows. Um, any home and garden show, anything with remodeling home and garden in the title, you want to be in that. I personally don't put my designers in my booth. I hire brand ambassadors to run my booth. It's something you can easily find. There's brand ambassador groups on Facebook where you can find these people. I train them, I pay them well, so they stick around so that year after year, their skills getting better. There are a lot of people that walk in the booth and don't realize that my brand ambassadors are not designers because right. they've been with me. Um, but we generate tons of appointments out of these shows. You know, other than that, you're doing some of the standard print where you're doing the local newspaper. You're doing things like Valpac, Money Mailer, RSVP Postcard, um, Clipper, the Home Mag, you know, all of those national um, print ads that Shelf Genie can tell you all about. And then what you got to do is you got to kind of tweak them. But the thing I will say is be very careful about making snap decisions. Don't sit there and stare at your appointments and stare at where they're coming from and think, oh my God, I just spent $2,000 on this ad and it only has one appointment. You got to let the stuff, it's, it's, it's almost like you're in Vegas. You got to let it ride. Yeah. You know, the <laughs> yeah. way I look at it is I analyze it on a quarterly basis. I look at how I perform quarterly and then I make small changes to what I'm doing. I don't make big changes. Um, 
small changes here and there, you know, maybe tweaking zones, maybe tweaking, you know, how many times you're in something, things like that to, to get your ROI on your marketing where it needs to be. Right. So maybe talk a little bit about how you were able, because I mean, you, you were an engineer, right? So you didn't yeah. really have a whole lot of marketing experience coming into this. And, and I think that's the case for most of the, the franchise partners that we have today and, and many of the people that are uh, looking at, as franchising as a way to get into business for themselves. So maybe talk a little bit about the support that you got from Shelf Genie when it came to kind of setting up and implementing that initial marketing strategy nine years ago, and then maybe talk a little bit about how, how that support has evolved over the years. So, um, you know, back when I did it, we had a, we had a website that really wasn't very good. The new one is 10 times better than what we had back then. You know, we weren't doing any social media. We weren't doing even a quarter of the digital that we're doing now. Yeah. Um, it was a lot of print and shelf genie, went out and found all the stuff that was available in my area. And then we talked through it and we made decisions and we went with it. But I utilize Shelf Genie to do that because I have no clue. I have no, marketing is still not my thing. I right. don't like it. It's not something I'm good at. I will tell you that every marketing decision I've made on my own and every contract that I've negotiated on my own has failed. <laughs> yeah. Um, I utilize them. Um, the team has gotten bigger, has gotten better. They're better at um, they're better at negotiating the contracts than you'll ever be. Um, especially when you're looking at national stuff like Valpac, you know, join them to do things like that so that they can use again. Now we have the national presence. We can get a lower. We can all get a lower price because there's so many of us doing it. Yeah, um, and they've done a really good job of of working with that. I mean, they've gotten some paper league programs set up for me, which we've never over seven years, almost eight years, we've never been able to get that set up. And I just had a meeting with the dispatch the other day and they were talking about how great the program is working. And it's like, I tried to tell you this eight years ago and you wouldn't listen to me. Explain what you mean by paper lead, just in case. So rather than paying a thousand dollars to post an ad. Yep. The advertiser is posting an ad and they are paid based on the number of phone calls we get from the ad. And there, there's criteria based on it can't be an advertiser calling you. It can't be, you know, the call has to last so long and there's all this criteria. But then you pay them a dollar amount on, for each of those leads. So basically you're getting the advertising for free. And if it doesn't generate anything, you don't pay anything. But right. if it does generate a lot, you pay you know, accordingly. So it's, it's the best of both worlds. Yep. Yeah. So it's more of a pay for performance model. And, and I think that's a good, a good example and something that, you know, we have seen these type of opportunities materialize over the, the last several years. And that's really just a result of Shelf Genie growing as an organization and us being able to leverage the size of the organization with some of these national advertisers. And it, it will result in not only better pricing, but also some of these more pay for performance type models where, you know, you're paying only if the results are there. And, and I think we'll see more and more of those opportunities as we continue to grow. Um, and, and to your point, too, it's especially if you don't really have experience in that sort of thing. And, and even if you do, you know, negotiating back and forth with a Valpac or, or a local newspaper sales rep is probably not the best use of your time as a business owner. You know, there's very likely other things that you'll get a better return on the investment of your time uh, by letting, you know, the, the marketing teams that we have in place handle some of that. Yeah. And I would say that the, the quality of the people at Shelf Genie, the skill level of the people at Shelf Genie has definitely increased tenfold over the last nine years that are doing this activity for us. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I would agree. And, and I think that's just a, a testament to the way the, the system's evolving and, and, you know, we'll continue to be able to recruit better talent uh, both at the franchise level and, and at the home office level, you know, as we continue to grow and uh, see the type of results that we've been seeing. So um, maybe, maybe talk a little bit about how you measure the performance of your marketing. And I think you bring up a great point to say that, you know, for some of this stuff, 
some of it's more going to be brand recognition. Some of it's going to be, you know, advertising that's aimed more at driving leads and appointments. And, and I think you bring up a, a really valid point in that you don't want to make rash decisions when it comes to, the, to, to some of this spend. But, you know, over time, so you said you look at it quarterly. How are you evaluating how well your different marketing vehicles are performing? So the first number I look at is CPA, cost per appointment. So I'm looking at how many appointments that advertising is generating and I'm looking at how, so then how much did I spend divided by how many appointments gives me cost per appointment. And I'm looking at that number um, and I'm looking at that number based on, okay, I've got five print ads. Is this one way out of whack with the other five? As I'm evaluating this, I'm also evaluating it with Shelf Genie. They can tell me where the averages are for the system, things like that. And I look at that. Then I also look at ROI, which was return on investment. So if I spent $1,000, or if I spent $3,000, or if I spent $1,000, but I sold $3,000, that means I have a three ROI. I, I sold $3,000 more. I sold three, th three times what I spent. Yep. But you got to be careful with ROI because what you have to also understand is you can have a marketing program that's generating all kinds of appointments, but because you haven't got your team where they should be and they're not closing where they should be or their RPA is not where it should be, you're not generating enough revenue off of that. But that has nothing to do with the marketing vehicle. That has to do with you and your team. That's right. So you have to be careful and analyze it in multiple ways. That's why I look at CPA and make sure, you know, I'm not paying some CPA that's way, way out of whack for this one. And then I look at how is my team, per, how is my team performing as a whole? And if my team's not quite where I need them to be, I understand my ROI might be a little low and I don't, and I won't necessarily back out of something because it has a low ROI when I think my team should be doing better. And if they had done better then the ROI would be better on that. So you kind of got to look at it a couple ways. Yeah, that's a very valid point. I mean, the, the marketing piece is really just the first half of the equation. You know, you've got to have a team in place that can capitalize on the opportunities that the, the marketing is creating uh, in order to get the ROI. Um, and you mentioned something earlier, you mentioned RPA. And so if, if anyone is not aware of RPA and what that stands for, that's revenue per appointment. So, you know, Michael just hit on two very important metrics that we look at in this business. You know, your cost per appointment on average, what is it costing you to get a designer in the door? And then what's your revenue per appointment? So on, on average, how much revenue is generated per appointment? And if you know those two numbers, you know, obviously the, the more room there is in between those two numbers, the more room there is for profitability. So those are, those are some metrics that we look at very closely um, in, in your market. And this is, this is one that, you know, can vary a little bit depending on the market that you're in and the part of the country that you're in. But what is kind of your goal for CPA in, in your market or market? Um, I'm always striving for like a $300-ish CPA. But there are advertising things I do that will be a higher CPA than that. Yeah. And, are, and shows will be a lower CPA than that. That's right. But I look at around a $300 average CPA. Yeah. So if across all of your marketing and all of the appointments that you're generating, if you can be there in that $300 or so range. So what's your goal for, for RPA for your team? Um, it's different per designer. So I set goals every year for each individual designer. A new designer's goal is always to get to a $1,500 RPA. That's their goal as a new designer is to hit that. That's what I consider the minimum that I want them to be performing at. And just so you know, that will get them a bonus at the end of a month. They're, they bonus based on what their RPA is. And if they're yep. a $1,500 RPA, they're at the lowest level bonus for a month. But then as they've been here for two or three years, I'm expecting that to go from 15 to 18 to $2,000 RPAs. Understanding that it's going to vary month by month, but at the end of the quarter, at the end of the year, where are they as a whole is what I'm really looking at. Because everybody can have a bad month, 
the next month they could close five sales from that previous month where they didn't close them on the spot, but they followed up and they closed them. So yep. you got, I average it out across. Yeah. And, and wish portal is how owners track all of this. We have a section in wish portal called the financial dashboard where you can very easily go and see, you know, how your team is performing in some of these key metrics. You can also see how that compares to the rest of the system. You know, are you above average or below average? Um, and, and Wish Portal will kind of calculate a lot of that on, on more of a three month rolling average uh, for all of the reasons that, that Michael just mentioned. Um, and, and for anyone that's not clear, the way revenue per appointment is calculated, it's, it's really a function of your team or, or an individual designer's average sell and their close rate. So Michael mentioned a $1,500 RPA, you know, that would be a, a $3,000 average sell with a 50% close rate would, would give a designer a $1,500 RPA. So uh, just in case anyone wasn't clear, that's how that's calculated. Um, so that's, that's all really good. And, and I'm going to open it up for, for questions. Um, and, and Angela, feel free to, to jump in if you have any questions um, that would be helpful for your purposes. But um, Dean, Angela, any, any questions for Mike uh, related to, to some of the marketing aspects of the business he just spoke to? Uh, I don't have anything right now. Yeah, I don't think I have anything either. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. Um, this is, this, yeah, this is all really good information and really helpful to hear from someone like Michael who's been doing it for a while and kind of um, been working with Shelf Genie Corporate and, and seeing the changes that they've put in place over the years to help their franchisees. That's not always something you get to hear about. Um, so that's, that's good to, to hear. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, Mike, you were pretty comprehensive in, in um you know, everything you just talked about. And, and I think you would agree that, you know, the, the name of the game is always, you know, finding ways to get as many appointments as possible for your team and to do it in as cost effective of a, a way as possible. And, uh, you know, I don't think you, you ever wake up one day and say, hey, my marketing plan's perfect. It's the type of thing you're always looking at it closely. You're always tweaking things and, and you're always, you know, trying new things or, or at least should be open to trying new things. And you kind of hit on it earlier, you know, talking about how, you know, when you first started, digital was not nearly as big of our, a uh, part of our strategy it is today. And, um, you know, we've got a, a, a team uh, supporting all of the franchise partners in a marketing capacity that can really, you know, stay in, on top of what the current trends in, in marketing and advertising are and, and try to keep us, you know, kind of on the, the cutting edge of, of whatever opportunities, you know, we may be able to tap into. Um, so yeah, I'm glad we kind of went in that direction. That's, I think something that, you know, most people have questions about, especially when you're first starting out, you know, in a new business and in a new market is, you know, how do you create awareness and, and how do you start generating some leads? Um, I did want to circle back because you, uh, mentioned territory earlier and, and territory being one of the, the concerns that you had with one of the other concepts you looked at. And, um, you know, now you have really multiple markets, right? So how many territories do you have total now? I have six total territories. So six territories. And that's, you know, that's not all that uncommon, you know, with other Shelf Genie owners. I mean, six may be more than, than most have, but most of the, the owners in Shelf Genie have multiple territories. And so, you know, maybe talk a little bit about why it's even feasible or why it's, it's manageable for you to you know, live in the Columbus area, but own and manage, you know, territories in Cincinnati and, and Dayton. So, yeah, when I started, I bought Columbus and it, Columbus is two territories and then Cincinnati and Dayton is four territories. Um, I kind of got to the point where it was, okay, what do I do here? Do I start another business in Columbus or do I expand within Shelf Genie? Yeah. And I felt like I was doing a really good job with Shelf Genie and I felt that I would be able to get a new Shelf Genie market up and running much faster and much easier than what it took me to get Columbus up and running because I knew more. And that's exactly what I've seen. Um, I mean, Cincinnati has come up to speed so much quicker than what Columbus did. You know, I understand more. I do understand more about marketing. So when we're talking about the marketing plan and the team, 
We put that together so much faster, started generating appointments so much quicker than we did in Columbus. The team came up to speed so much quicker. It is two hours away, um, but I've, I've done a pretty good job of backing myself out of running too many appointments. Um, I did just have a designer leave in Columbus, so I'm running appointments now, but I'm training someone to take that person's spot once they're up and running. Then I won't be running as many appointments in Columbus, and I can spend my time mentoring, shadowing, and training my team to get them to fill in those few little gaps we have left. Now, I will say this. I don't know that I can – I don't know that I'll get Cincinnati where it necessarily could be if there was someone with boots on the ground in Cincinnati, but I'm going to get it pretty close. Yeah. Yeah, and so, so the key, it sounds like, is, you know – having a good team in place. And, and that's certainly one of the things that, you know, I really try to stress to candidates and coach them on through this process is, you know, as an owner, your, your primary responsibility should be, uh, and you said it, you know, recruiting, training, and mentoring your team of designers yes. and installers. So, um, and, and, and for some people, you know, that's, that's a bit intimidating, you know, it's certainly, you know, there's no silver bullet when it comes to recruiting and, um, you know, you just mentioned, you, you know, having a designer leave. So maybe share some of the best practices that you've picked up over the years when it comes to recruiting designers and installers and, and how to go about, you know, training and mentoring them with the help of the home office, of course. But uh, what have you learned over the years when it comes to building the team? Um, fire fast, hire slow. Yeah. Don't, don't hold on to somebody that's not the right fit. You're just – you're wasting more time on them than what you would spend replacing them. And, um, you know, never beg somebody to work for you. Find the people that want to do this. Find the people that are begging you for the job. Um, in the past, it's been, you know, any warm body I would hire. And that, that is not the case anymore. Yeah. I will go run appointments myself until I find somebody that's the right fit. Um, I will say that some of my best practices as far as how I'm hiring have changed over the years. You know, I used to post on Craigslist. I won't post anything on Craigslist. You spend way too much time weeding through garbage on Craigslist. I can imagine. Yeah. Um, the one that has worked phenomenal for me over the past couple of years has been indeed. Mm -hmm. And you know what I will say about any of them, whether you're using ZipRecruiter, indeed, any of these, you will get somebody who is like your contact there when you sign up, use them, learn how to use that site, learn the tricks of using that site. Every couple of weeks you want to close your ad, you want to copy it and open a new ad so that it pops up at the top. If you've got an ad out there for a week and nobody's responding, change the stinking ad. There's something about it that's not working. Right. You know, yeah constantly be tweaking this stuff and finding it. You know, I found one ad. Normally when you sign up, you get to post three ads. I'll post the same ad three different ways. Yeah. Three different titles. And it'll be amazing how one title will, that's the one that everybody responds to. And the other two get hardly anybody responding to them. It is definitely an art to figure that out and tweak things. Yeah, you're kind of A-B a, B testing them against each other to see which ones get better responses. Absolutely, and don't yeah. wait. And the thing that I like about using these sites is they will let you put in like three preliminary questions. Okay. When somebody applies, they have to answer three questions. If they apply and they don't answer those questions, I don't talk to them. I don't call them. I don't anything. They're rejected. Yeah. If they can't follow the simple instructions of answering three questions. What makes you think they're ever going to be able to follow the instructions you're going to try to give them to be a designer? Yeah, That's it's a good filter. First filter right there. Yep. Um, you know, and then I just use, I use some of the, some of the interview questions that I've seen before. I used to use our, we used to do something called predictive index and we kind of, show you what type of person they are when I don't, I think we did away with that if I remember correctly, but you know, just, just come up with some really good questions to ask the people and do a good phone screening with them. Take them out on an appointment with you and meet with them after the appointment. 
you know, do everything you can up front. Spending that time up front will save you hours in the end. Because if they're not the right fit, you need to tell them they're not the right fit and move on to the next candidate. Because you will waste so much time in the training process when they're just never going to get it. Yep. So front end, really heavy on that front end. With installers, the thing that has worked really well for me is using a website called Thumbtack. Thumbtack is a website where you can post that you need some job done, and then all of these professionals will respond to you. Yep. Saying, I can do this job, or I can do that for you, I can do that, and some, they'll give you quotes, whatever. Yeah. But I'm, very, I'm not tricking them. So I am posting that I need rollout shelves installed. There is a way to post that on this website. But what I end up doing is then I take it and it says, do you want to say more about the, more about your project? Right. In that space, I tell them who I am and what I'm doing. Right. Yeah. So they don't think they're coming to you. I do own this business. This is what we do. I would love to talk to you more. And I get a lot of good responses from that. What I got to say, I mean, that was a, that was a piece of advice you gave Kelly, my wife, and, and we found our installer down in South Carolina through Thumbtack. And, uh, you know, he owns a kitchen remodeling business and, you know, has kind of looked at doing installations for our Shelf Genie franchises, just an added revenue stream. And, um, you know, he's, he's been phenomenal. Um, so that was a little tip that we were able to, to pick up from you. So uh, thanks for that. Um, and, and you hit on something earlier that I wanted to, to talk about a little bit more. Uh, when you said, you know, you shouldn't be begging someone to do this. So I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, knowing how to to really position the opportunity appropriately to designers and installers. I mean, part of it, of course, comes down to knowing where to look for good designers and installers. And, you know, that's something that the, the home office and other franchise partners uh, can help newer franchisees with. Um, but talk a little bit about maybe what you've learned over the years as to how to, to best position the opportunity so that you're not, you know, kind of begging these people to come work for you. They're, they're chomping at the bit to have the opportunity to do so. I mean, it is your own little business within a business. Um, they manage their calendar. They manage everything they do. They're subcontractors. You know, I'm not dictating to them that they have to do this. They have to do that. Um, sometimes I'm strongly pushing that you have to do this or that, but I'm not dictating. Ultimately, they can decide how they want to do things. Um, but there is a shelf genie way to doing things. And if they're not going to follow that way, then, um, they're not going to be a fit and they're not going to make it through training. But, you know, the flexibility of being able to arrange their schedule the way they want to be able to arrange it. Um, the flexibility to run as many or as few or as many appointments as they want to make the amount of money that it is that they want to make. Um, All of that's very, very appealing. There's a lot of people who love that idea, but then there's a lot of people who when they find out it's a commission job that scares the crap out of them because they've never worked that type of a position right before. Um, So that's the kind of stuff where you got to position it that way so that they understand it. I never tell somebody this is a full-time job. It's always a part-time job, but you can make darn near full-time money working a part-time job doing this, but it's all up to you. And, and, you know, position it that way that it is a business within a business and that, you know, I'm not sitting here with my thumb on you all day. You know, we're not sitting in cubicles next to each other and I'm checking, looking over your shoulder, checking every single thing you're doing and no, you did it wrong. I need it this way. That's not the way this works. Yeah. But to be, but I also do come out and shadow you and give you, you know, I think you could do better if you would tweak this or tweak that. And it's not so much in telling you how to do something. It's more in trying to help you improve and help you make more money because you make more money. I make more money. Well, for sure, especially with designers, right? Because if they're spending their time driving around and running appointments and not closing enough of them, chances are you can go and shadow them and give them some coaching and that's going to be, you know, if they accept the coaching and apply it, that's going to be in everyone's best interest. They'll close more, they're getting more money for the time they're putting into it. And of course it's better for you as the business owner. And, and so I think that's a a big part of it is, you know, not only positioning the opportunity appropriately, but also, you know, setting the expectations because you're right. I mean, with, with them being, 
uh, for the most part, subcontractors, you're not dictating, you know, when they have to be somewhere and how long they have to spend there, but you, you are, and you have the ability as the business owner to set the expectations. So when it comes to an installer, you assign a job to them, you know, you have certain expectations as to how quickly they reach out and contact the client and schedule a measurement appointment and, you know, how quickly the installation's done after they receive the delivery. But beyond that, you know, they're, they're really free to kind of do it on their own terms. So I think setting expectations is key because if it's not done right up front, you're going to be fighting an uphill battle to try and manage your expectations on the back end. Um, yeah. And if, if you've got somebody questioning you on that, you know, here's the shelf cleaning process. You do an intro call, you do this, you know, you call them within so many, if they're questioning on you on that, like really questioning you on that, they're they not. Get it. Yeah. They don't get it. Move on. Yeah. And, and I think there's a, cause, cause you mentioned that, you know, some people, especially the commission only type of compensation structure that scares some people. And so I think there is some strategy that, that can be implemented when it comes to you know, getting in front of potential designers and installers that are going to be better suited and likely more interested in the opportunity. Um, and I'm curious, you know, as to kind of the makeup of your team, but I know it's fairly common throughout the system where, you know, some of the installers are small business owners themselves. So, you know, the, the concept of, you know, kind of not being paid hourly and that sort of thing is, is not so new and scary to them. They're, they're like, wise, no, it's not nearly as scary because they're most of them. You're exactly right. They're either working that type of position already or they're small business owners and they get that. Yep. In designers, you can get a little bit more, um, people who are a little bit more hesitant because of that, because they haven't worked that way before. I will say the one thing that, and this is, I don't want to, I don't want to say that this will never work, but if you're hiring somebody who's a salesperson from another, whether it's a bath fitter or a, they're selling bathtubs or blinds, right. I personally have never been able to get one of those people to be a good fit. They have way too many bad habits from the other location they've just learned a different sales approach than what we teach at shelf genie is that what you mean basically yes yeah they're more of a hard sale than they are a soft sale they're more about the sale than they are about helping the person yeah yeah and that's that's key for us it, it's really got to be a very consultative approach to sales and and it you know it's probably a warmer uh appointment than a lot of these other kind of home service companies may have. I mean, I think you mentioned earlier, I mean, these are people that have proactively reached out to us and said, yes, I'd love to have a designer come in and show me my options. So it's about as warm of a kind of sales appointment or opportunity that you could get. But the key to a good designer is someone that can, of course, build rapport with the client that can really listen because, you know, we come in and, and really customize our solutions to meet a, a client's specific needs. So you, you need a designer that's got the ability to listen and understand and then take what they've learned and, and design a solution that's going to truly be a, a great fit for the client. And um, so to your point, you certainly don't need someone with, with prior sales experience. If they have all of those qualities I just mentioned, you know, we can train them uh, when it comes to the design side of it and, and the product knowledge that they'll need. Um, yep. I know one of the things that's pretty common throughout the system is uh, similar to, to, what we've talked about with installers, you know, almost doing the same with designers. I know there's a lot of people that have, you know, successfully recruited interior designers and professional organizers and, you know, people that may already kind of have a foot in this space that uh, again, are more likely to kind of understand the dynamic as far as the compensation goes. But, you know, to me, what's most interesting about that approach is someone like an interior designer or professional organizer is probably better suited to actually bring business to the franchise owner instead of the franchise owner having to funnel all of the appointments yeah. or opportunities to them. So I've, have you been able to incorporate any or a similar strategy when it comes to designers? When I opened Columbus, my first three designers were all professional organizers. Okay. Uh, yeah. They did fairly well, but basically all three of them have since left. And most of it was just due to life changes, you know, yeah. one wanted to grow her business more and her business has grown tenfold. 
and the organizing side. So she didn't need the extra income of Shelf Genie. Another one, you know, had gotten engaged and had stepkids and just things, things, life changes and some people move on. Um, the people I have now, I've got retired people. I've got, you know, moms who just want to make a little extra money. Uh, I've got, I've got kind of all over the place as far as, you know, the people working for me. Yeah. Well, and I think especially in the, the day and age that we're in with, you know, Uber and, and kind of the, the gig economy, if you will, um, it, it resonates even more so with people, you know, the type of opportunity that uh, the, the role of designers and installers offers. So um, this is good. I, I know we've got only about 10 minutes or so left. So I do want to just kind of quickly uh, open it up to see if there's any questions. Um, you know, based on anything that we've talked about or, or anything that we haven't, you know, gotten into. Um, Dean, Angela, anything you guys would like to ask Michael? No, I don't have anything right now. Okay. Uh, Michael, all this information has been very good. Um, you're kind of alluded to, my question is, turnover rate on designers and installers. You said you had one just leave and then you had other ones that have left for different reasons? Is it high, low? My entire Columbus team has been turned over several times in eight years. Um, I will say this, when I'm hiring, I always try to hire twice as many people as what I need, knowing that people are gonna drop out throughout the process, hoping that if I need two people, I've got four people in training, I'm hoping at the end I got two that stick. The, a lot of the turnover is in that training process. It's people, some people, no matter how much you talk to them about the training process and what they got to do, think that all they need is a demo kit and their computer and they can go out and sell this stuff. And it just doesn't work that way. Um, you know, they, they have it set in their mind that they're the greatest salesman in the world and they're going to be able to sell this stuff and they don't need me to show them anything. And, there's a lot of stuff you have to learn and it takes a little while to be able to learn that stuff and get live. I mean, I would say, Wes, you can kind of chime in here too, but I would say at least a month to be out there live running appointments on your own. Yeah. And three months to get relatively good at it. Yep. I, I would agree with that. And, and then to your point earlier, you know, fire fast. I mean, you know, for in, in some cases, there will be instances where you don't even need a month to realize that someone's not a good fit. And in those situations, you know, every shelf genie franchise owner can give you examples of this. You know, it's better to cut bait sooner than later and, and move on to the next. And, you know, I, I like your approach, Michael, and always recruiting and trying to hire more than you need. And I think the other reason that you know, some, some franchise owners may see turnover. I mean, the, the word turnover kind of has a negative connotation, right? But if you're doing it the right way, and if you're always, especially from a designer, you know, aspect of the business, if you're always recruiting and looking for good talent to add to your team, you know, the cream always rises to the top, right? So especially when it comes to the appointments that an owner's generating through their marketing dollars, you're going to award those appointments to the best performing de designers. So you know, if you've added more talent to the team and the bar has raised and, you know, maybe you've got a designer that's been with you for a while, but they haven't, you know, raised their standards with the rest of the team, they may just kind of naturally phase out because they're no longer getting the same number of opportunities they were in the past because they're no longer the best designer. So I think it's important to just, you know, make it clear that turnover is not always a bad thing. No, I mean, to talk to your point, you can have a designer that's sitting there at a $1,500 RPA. So they're performing adequately. They're solid. They're a rock. They're performing. It's every once in a while, they'll have that month where they'll bump up and they'll have an 1800 or a 2000 RPA, but they're pretty much right there at that $1,500 level. The next person you could hire could be a $2,000 RPA designer. That $500 change you have no clue how big of a bump that is to your revenue. Yeah. And, you know, you may feel bad letting this person who's been with you, go, been with you for two years go when they're, they're a solid performer, but that next performer could perform so much better 
that it's just, it's better for you and your business. And ultimately this is a business. Yeah. And usually with that, even though it, it can be hard to do usually for the person that, that, you know, maybe getting, you know, let go or that there's not a, as much of a role for them anymore, that's usually going to free them up to go find something that's a better fit for them anyways. And they're, they're usually going to be happier in the long run. So yeah. yeah. And usually we feel worse about it than what they feel about it having happened to them. Yeah, no, that's, that's very true. Um, so that, that's a good point. And, and, you know, Dean, I know that's something you and I have talked about and, and, you know, you don't want too much turnover, but a lot of times, you know, especially when you're eight, nine years in, you know, turnover is just a natural part of, of your business evolving. And, you know, it's, it's said within all types of organizations, small businesses to huge corporations, you know, the people that get you to a certain point are likely not going to be the same people that, that take you to the next level and, and beyond that. So, you know, I, I think mean, that I'll, sure. I'll be honest with I'll you. Take. I had, I let a designer go this last year that I don't think many Shelf Genie franchisees would have let go. She finished the year last year, like number four in average sale. Her average sale was through the roof. Um, she had a really high RPA, everything. She's a good performer, but she had the lowest NPS, which is our, is our quality survey score of any designer I had. And I continued to try and work through this with her and she would not change and she was costing me more money because I was having to get people money back because they didn't like this or didn't like that. Mm. I mean, there was all this quality review stuff going on and you know, my installers having to spend twice as much time. It was just causing too many headaches. And ultimately I had to let her go, even though sales wise, she was a great performer, but what she was selling, she was designing problems and I could not get her to stop doing it. So ultimately I had to let her go. Yeah. Um, real quick, Michael, um, it's been great information again. Um, when I talked to you on my call prior that you and Wes had let me know that when you first started out, you kind of started out slow. And I think it was when we were talking is basically you got to follow the system and you weren't quite following the system when you started out. And I don't know all the details, but um, what was it that, I mean, what, when you started out and then what made, you know, turn the corner and it, like starting the, following the system or, or kind of like what, how'd you get off on the right, wrong track, but then get on the right track and so, move forward? So this story has been told numerous times to the point where I just put my head down every time they t start to tell this story. <laughs> But Sorry to bring that. I mean, so just, I just out, briefly, because we did out, talk about it. Yeah, I mean, I started out really well when I started. Yeah. Rookie of the year. But I kind of got in a rut. I was just going through the motions. Um, and I really wasn't selling based on emotion. I wasn't selling our noble purpose, anything like that. I was go doing what we call going in and counting and quoting. You got four cabinets, two in each cabinet. That's eight. It'll be this much money. Um, and my sales were not increasing. You know, my revenue was not increasing. I was stagnant and I wasn't making enough money to, that I wanted, you know, at that point I wanted to be giving my, paying myself more so that I could live a little better, go on some better vacations. And none of that was happening. And I came down to conference that year, which is in June every year. And the whole premise of that conference that year was noble purpose. Our noble purpose is we turn frustration and pain into enjoyment and love. It's all about the client. It's all about the client's experience. What is the client's problem? Why is that a problem for them? Designing around problems, 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 not you know, counting, quoting, and that stuff. I quickly realized that it wasn't Shelf Genie that had a problem, it was Mike that had a problem. I came home, changed everything about what I was doing, got hyper client focused, and everything exploded. I mean, I had 60% growth in revenue that year, changing that, and changing that mindset of my team and me and everything, and I continue to stress that to today, and because of that, we're still having phenomenal numbers, and that's what really got me, got me going, is I wasn't making enough money. I was ready to bail on the system until I went to conference, got smacked upside the head, realized that, 
Shelf Genie's not doing anything wrong, Mike is. And I got off my butt, and uh, here I am today. And it, it's a good story, which is why it has been, you know, to Michael's point, told over and over again. But um, it, it's a good story, and, and I think it's true. I mean, it does sound cliche, but, you know, there's a system for a reason, and, and following the system is, you know, going to be the key to success. And it's not to say that you can't, you know, add your own personal touch to it and, and that we don't encourage innovation, uh, but it's that the, the especially the framework of the system is there because it works. So... Uh, well, Mike, I know you've got a, a hard stop, man. So uh, again, I really hopefully make a sale. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So we'll let you get to that. Thank um, you for your information, Michael. Yes, best of luck to you. Yeah, thanks a lot for your time, and I'll let you go ahead and drop off, Mike. And if all it's right. all right, I'm just going to share some ways that that folks can reach out to you if they'd like to pick your brain a little further. Absolutely, um, I'm an open book. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks again, and uh, good luck with your appointment. And uh, we'll catch up soon, I'm sure. All right. Thanks, guys. So, Dean, if, uh, if you do want to have another conversation with, with Mike, I know he'd be happy to, to jump on another call with you. And, and uh, you should already have his contact information. And, and for anyone else on the call or watching this after the fact, these are some ways that you can reach out and get in touch with Mike. Uh, you can find him on LinkedIn. And you see his Shelf Genie email address there. And, um, you know, Mike, just like the rest of our franchise partners are, are happy uh, to speak with anyone that is interested in learning more about Shelf Genie. Uh, it's kind of a, a standard part of the discovery process that anyone works through with me uh, to have the opportunity to reach out and talk with any of our franchise owners one on one. Uh, I think it's an incredibly valuable part of the process where you can really learn a lot. And, you know, it's important to keep in mind that Every Shelf Genie franchisee we have today was, you know, in, in your position at one point in time where they were trying to evaluate, you know, various opportunities and determine if it was a good fit for them or not. So they're all very happy and, and willing to, to share, you know, their experience and their advice with you, uh, you know, recognizing that, that they were, you know, in the same seat at one point in time. So um, I hope this was helpful today. I really appreciate everyone taking the time to join us and, and for the uh, good questions. And um, as always, you know, you know how to get in touch with me. I'm here as a resource for you. Um, so don't hesitate to reach out if there's anything that I can help with. Uh, but with that, we'll go ahead and uh, wrap it up. But thanks again. Hope everybody has a great rest of the day and an awesome week. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.